Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 75, Princess Nest, an important woman of Wales. Over the past year or so, we've talked pretty exclusively about the people of Wales, but collectively, let's be honest, the men of Wales have featured in most of the story. Even when we go back in time and look at some of the older sources, we're still only talking about women in very specific circumstances and examples. Um, as I've said in the past, it's almost impossible to find references of women, even in Roman Britain or in the early medieval period. And the few samples we do have are very minimal descriptions or visions of what these women were or what they did. And in some ways, it makes it incredibly frustrating. So often they feel like they're invisible people. Even more than, say, slavery, you know they exist. You know they have significant roles to play in their world. But we were left with an impression that they were silent in history. Or if they made a sound, it was only to feel the real history of men. And I wanted today to do a little bit on this because I think it's important to realize that within every group, there are groups that are marginalized and not talked about as much as other groups. It happens in when we get into British history. Quite often it becomes English history with the little bits and pieces of other history mixed in. There's almost nothing when you look at some of these documents and books that have been written, which includes Wales, other than specific incidences. And so it's something that I think most people who've looked at Welsh history can feel some empathy towards, because when you're a group that isn't talked about a lot, it's harder to make an emphasis, make a point, be somebody who is important to history. That doesn't mean that any of these people are not important to history. In fact, the proof is, in our modern day, is that women have an incredible role to play in the way the world is shaped, the way it is developed, and the way it functions. And that was not any different in those days. Just because the way that they were treated was different or the way that they were perceived was different didn't change the fact that they had a heavy influence on society and a heavy influence on the way the world worked. Obviously, in the medieval period, one of the ways that we learn about women in that period is not from what they do, but rather what their influence is on either the descendancy of the crown. Um, for example, in the Gwyneth traditions, there is a strong tradition which actually goes against the the normal Welsh ancestral rules where the the last female member of the previous regime is used as the example of, of where the descendancy comes from for the next regime. And that proves that they have an important role in that regard, but it doesn't give them a great role, to be fair. And in all honesty, our perception of that is influenced by that as well. We have to understand our history that we're looking at in this period especially is written by clergymen who aren't necessarily dealing with women on a way in a fashion that we do who are supposedly celibate and thus not necessarily in touch with or deal with women on a day-to-day -day basis. Likely they did, but I mean, you don't understand someone if you don't really deal with them all the time. And I think there is a... One could make the assumption that part of the problem here is that when something's written from one perspective, one gender's perspective, it makes it very difficult to understand the other gender, especially when your value of that gender comes through not their actual input, but rather on their worth as a trading commodity or their worth as a parent in handing genes to other children in a monarchy. The understanding of women as objects of beauty, of compassion, of being a symbol of purity, or in other cases, being the symbol of deviltry, uh, is a very common motif both in ancient times and medieval times. And let's be honest, we can say it goes forward from there. But certainly in this period, that is something that is, is brought up. And, and one of the examples of this I wanted to talk about today is one of our few historical contexts from this period, 
which gives us an understanding about the perception of women at the time and kind of where things are at as far as the political machinations that are going on in Wales as the Normans are settling and controlling and dominating various areas of Wales at this point. So specifically today, we're going to talk about one of the figures that is both perceived as almost a mythical in nature, but yet is an important historical figure and one of the few women in the independence period, which is mentioned specifically and and who has an incident worth discussing to those writing the history, and that would be Nest Furch Rees. She was the daughter of the king of uh, Doithbarth, Rees ap Tudor, and was considered to be a very important woman even during the period of her life that they actually went into detail about her life. Now, of course, it's done in a way that shows her victimhood, her beauty, her idealized nature rather than her actually being someone of independence, someone of strength, and someone who actually has uh, a large portion to do with later history. So in that respect, we have to evaluate it based on some of the information we're given and deal with it from that perspective. So what is the background of Nest? Nest was born uh, in 1085, as I said earlier. She was born to the last independent king of Doithbarth at that period of time because they were invaded shortly thereafter by the Normans in 1093. The kingdom actually is recorded to have fallen and Nest and her brothers are spirited into Ireland for safety. Some may have been captured, some executed, some having not so very fun things done with them. We're not exactly given loads of information on how this happened and how they escaped and how some got captured and some didn't and why some got captured or some didn't. We do know that from the histories that are written, she is claimed to have many half-brothers and half-sisters, uh, several of which are illegitimate, and that there is a still, even with that, there's still a number of, in quotes, legitimate children around. So, But we just don't know a lot of what happened to most of the older siblings who were either captured or, and in some cases, were probably executed. In fact, she's when she was captured and brought back to the English court, of William Rufus, she actually came to the attention of his younger brother, Henry, who would, of course, become the future Henry I, uh, and she actually bore him one of his illegitimate children. So obviously there was something about her that attracted attention, attracted the interest of a number of different people, because she will be historically important because of this issue. Uh, She ends up next married to uh, Gerald Fitzwalter of Windsor, and they set up shop in Pembroke Castle, and Gerald eventually has five children with her. Yet, so in this small period of time, she's had six children, and we don't really know how old she is at the time. We don't know how old she is when all of this occurs. But the accusation, again, is, as I said earlier, is made about her beauty and about her uh, stunning nature that made her worthwhile, which is Ness becomes a central person in the story of the Welsh after the Norman Conquest because she becomes one of those people who is an example of the combination of the Welsh and the Normans. In the Norman mindset, she is a example of coexistence of, you know, the new normal as the Normans kind of integrate with the Welsh population. She becomes a member of that aristocracy. In fact, Ness, through her husband and through uh, descendancies that will come through it, has claimed that the Tudors, the Stuarts, uh, even up to John F. Kennedy, are all related to this woman. So she has significance in that way. But if, again, we're looking at that from a maternal descendancy issue instead of how who she was as a person. 
One thing that comes across in the stories, whether they're true or not, is that Nest was someone who was very much loyal to her husband, Gerald, believed in him enough that she stood up to uh, the Welsh who would come and attack her husband's castle and take it. Now, the stories, of course, are one thing, and we don't have a full account. We have what amounts to a construction of a story in which words are put into mouths of various people, and and in some respects, we have to take it at face value. In other respects, we have to be hesitant and say, you know, is this an example of Welsh patriotism going overboard? Is it an example of English people basically accepting the 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 party line effectively that they're really just nice people and the Welsh are being mean to them. And we'll talk a little bit about this when we get to Gerald of Wales, that there is this concept that the Welsh are unruly, they are ungovernable at times, they are quick to have wars and fighting. So this kind of fits into this category of understanding. And this is part of the problem. I mean, when you have these circumstances and situations, it creates the issue and and decorates the issue in a way that looks good from a propaganda standpoint. So Owen Ap Cadguin, the Prince of Powys, the heir to the throne, raids Doithbarth and causes issues throughout that area of Wales. And in a way, the perception of what he does and to whom he does it to has... It creates this brilliant propaganda piece for the Normans and in some ways for the Welsh, which is used both at the time and in the future, which will go forward as as an argument for why, you know, you can't trust them and, and they're they're problematic. So let's get into it in further detail then, shall we? Obviously, Ness's lineage as a princess to the last king of Welsh, Doithbarth at the time, makes her a key component to all this. She is a key cog in legitimizing whomever, I mean, I hate to say it this way, but effectively owns her, owns legitimacy in the area. And certainly we've seen in the past that the old uh, monarchs and their descendants are held in higher esteem than the new guy who's coming into town to try and take over. And so quite often what we'll see, at least argued in the history, if not necessarily an actual fact, is that the way to legitimize the new leader is to make him a descendant through a maternal line. So she's important in that respect. She becomes recognizable as a link to that dynasty. And the idea that she would be a key descendant for the Normans who are invading and for the Welsh who are trying to stop them is pretty obvious if we look at this. And problematically at the time, of course, all of the various dynasties in Wales are fighting amongst themselves trying to gain possession of the country. You know, the... Rhys himself had been fighting for it. Uh, The leaders in Gwyneth and in Powys who have started to rise back up again in public view are also fighting for it, although the borders of Powys at this stage have changed quite dramatically. They've gone south, and so they're much more a mid-Wales kingdom rather than a north Wales kingdom. And there is this problematic confrontation that's going on amongst all of these various rulers, when the Normans come in, of course, and start to take over parts of South Wales. So Gerald's marriage to Nest makes perfect sense. If you can marry him into that line, then that gives a link for the Normans in Wales. And because of the loyalty that the locals would have to her, they would be less likely to go and fight against her for the, you know, the opposition, basically. A news story gets shared by a friend on social media, or you catch a tweet that really makes your blood boil. But how do you separate fact from fiction? 
That's the premise behind Disinformation, a 10-part series from Evergreen Podcasts and Emergent Risk International coming this fall. Tune in to Disinformation wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, don't believe everything you read. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words, a podcast that presents the unvarnished, unsanitized truth of what we have asked of those who defend this nation. As a country, we need these stories more than ever. Stories from Americans who have borne the battle, including 30-year-old remastered interviews with veterans from World War I recounting their time in the trenches of Europe, and with veterans from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and from our most recent conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other battlefields Americans may never have heard of. Hear their stories by listening to Warriors in Their Own Words wherever you find podcasts. History is complicated. The story of human progress is long, messy, and riddled with controversies big and small. On Conflicted, we dive headfirst into history's most infamous events and contentious figures. We try and untangle the good from the bad, the fact from the fiction, and the monsters from the misunderstood. Was Genghis Khan a murderous butcher or a civic pioneer? Did the allied powers go too far? in firebombing the German city of Dresden at the twilight of World War II? And how did the Marquis de Sade acquire such a sinister reputation? And was any of it true? These are just a few of the tough questions we wrestle with and investigate on Conflicted. So if you love history or just enjoy a good story, please join me, your host, Zach Cornwell, for a fascinating new topic each and every month. Conflicted, a history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I hope to see you soon. If one looks at the way Nest herself is, in quotes, used, the one thing that comes across to me in looking at this from a historical standpoint, is that you can see that she is using the power that she does have to create a safe point for herself. And this may have been done basically because fear for her life, having seen what happened to her other siblings and her parents. It may be that she's using her sexual relationships with some of these men as a way to gain power or... Maybe it's done simply because of her beauty. She is able to demand the attentions of a lot of very powerful men in and around Norman England. And certainly she, as I said before, has a relationship with Henry I, which then leads to a son being born named Henry, who is brought up in Gerald's household. There is at least one other child that we know of that may have been born to her in an illegitimate fashion. Um, And we do know eventually she marries on two occasions, once to Gerald and then when he passes away to Stephen. And these both being Normans, which again points to the fact that she had loyalty or at least had been brought up around the Norman ideal enough that she had adapted to it and took it upon her. You know, it became a part of the Norman line of succession rather than being separate or maintaining the independence as a Welsh person against them? Or was she accommodating what little she could for her people through these marriages, through these relationships? We we don't really know for sure because, of course, what we get is a very stilted point of view from a number of different sources. And, of course, when Owain appears in Powys and he starts to move against the old kingdom of Doithbarth and in the early part of the 12th century starts to deal with trying to destroy that linkage to the old kingdom and kill Gerald and take over his household. There is a lot of talk about this. And of course, a key point in this whole thing that's discussed in our sources is this capture and taking of Nest by Owen. Now there's talk, and again, we have to keep in mind there's propaganda within this. You know, 
is this something of a uh, patriotic thing? Is it something that we look at where he was freeing his cousin from the tyranny of the English? Uh, one would have to doubt that based on what happens later, but at least that's kind of a claim that could be made, I guess. There's also the fact that she is accused of having been raped by him. Uh, some very late sources argue that there were children born, but there's no evidence of that in actual history that we can point to. There's a lot of sketchily described things without any actual linkage. So children that are born, supposedly one of whom turns out to be probably Owen's brother, which is very unlikely to have been uh, their, their progeny. Uh, there's also the idea that there's this other child who's born to Owen and a woman who's unnamed, but there's no need for him to have necessarily raped her in order to have these people. But the story goes that he raped her in front of her children. So the idea and the constant perspective is, is that her beauty and her, her image as a pure being would have drawn in all of these men and all of their interests. And again, is she using that ability, that that bonus that she has from that? And I say this very, very much in the perspective of when you're in this position, when you don't have a lot of control, people have, it has been shown, will use what they can to kind of maintain some semblance of control in their lives. And so in the cases of, say, slaves, they use what they can they do what they can to keep themselves from being completely dominated. They might have a little parcel of land they grow. They have little things that they do to try and create families amongst themselves. We, we look at the African-American examples. They weren't allowed to get married, so they had their own little ceremonies, which were kind of like marriages. So there are things that people do within their own power structure that allows them to have influence. And obviously a, a well-born woman is not the same as an African slave in America, but within the control that is given, they have to find ways to be able to express their power. And they might do that through their children. They might do it through the control they have over those children. Uh, it's quite often where we see women brought in as to, to basically take over a kingdom on behalf of their young child. That'll happen sometimes in England, it happens sometimes in Wales. But yet at the same time, you have to keep in mind that within that, there is an acknowledgement that they don't have full control. They don't have the same level of expectation and maybe, let's say, respect that a male heir to the throne might have or a male firstborn son might have in this period. So with that in mind, it seems like she uses her beauty in quotes to her advantage and to create what she needs out of her life, which is safety, security, and a family, which again may also be that she has some sense of linkage to the people. She may have all sorts of reasons why she's doing that, that we're just never going to know. But within all that defined, it, it is very interesting that by the end of all this, Nest has become a mother of eight sons and two daughters by five different men, including the King of England, Henry I. And so she is definitely a strong medieval woman and a strong example of such. So when we talk about her, understand that she very much seems to have been a very intelligent person who understood what advantages she had in appearance to have taken advantage of them. And the way she's colored in the sources doesn't show her as someone who is in awe or in held as just simply an image of beauty. She obviously is able to coincide with these men and have some input. The, the quotes that they get from her that she tries to protect her husband by sending him away the idea that she um, would defend herself and her honor in front of Owen, uh, it shows to us that there is a sense that she is not just somebody to be taken lightly. 
In fact, in the Chronicles of the Princes, it actually goes further than that and points out that it, it says that when Owen, upon hearing of her beauty and of who she was and how critical she was, went to try and take her by force uh, and raided the castle to try and capture her. Um, and so he basically raises a commotion to try and draw them out. Gerald wakes up. And again, this is from the Welsh perspective. He is terrified and indecisive on hearing all of this going on, couldn't deal with it. So Ness takes control of the situation and advised and helped Gerald to escape. Uh, specifically, they point out through the toilets. Uh, and once he was sure that they'd escaped, she then calls out to the attackers and surrenders. And then Owen destroys the castle he seizes his nest and her two sons and a daughter of gerald's uh by another woman and abducts them and at that point uh it, according to the um the brute the chronicles of the princess uh owen violated nest now that straight up means that he raped her if that's to be believed and this just comes down to a concept of that Owen is, especially in later periods, has been looked at as a loose cannon, someone who can't be trusted, someone who effectively did things on impulse, and because he did it, he ruined a lot of the Welsh independence. Um, that's retrospective looking back. It, it's hard to argue that at this point, because this kind of stuff was going on quite frequently, in this period where men would raid other leaders and other noble people and even the local populace, they would take women, they would kill the men, they would enslave some people even to this point in time. And there was still that sense that there was a way to control situations and marry into these various families through this method. Um, and yet at the same time, this shows to us that that's not exactly going to happen because in the end, like I said, Gerald escapes. Eventually, that then goes and backfires on Owen as Ness doesn't have any desire for him. And again, because I think we're shown that she's a fairly strong woman, um, she ends up back with her husband and back free from supposed safety by the Welsh uh, prince. According to the Edwardian historian uh, Lloyd, it, it he, in fact, tries to pull this idea that, that Nest actually worked with Owen, that she actually didn't want to be in the Norman possession, in quotes, and that she was in love with Owen, and thus the reason why she tries to escape uh, in effect, he calls her Helen of Wales and does set this idea that she's a very beautiful woman that everyone desired. So you have to understand that later historians have definitely influenced what we understand and how we look at it. And of course, beauty is a concept which changes from era to era, from decade to decade. You know, our concepts of beauty even now have gone back and forward several times. I mean, if you look at, at what a male perception of beauty was, say, in the 1950s versus the 1960s versus the 1970s. And now they all differ a lot. And again, that perception is something we have to look at because we don't know what that would mean. We don't really, our, our vision when we see beauty is probably different than how it was perceived in this period. And certainly we have to understand that. But it does make one wonder, basically, what was going on uh, there. And as I say, I definitely feel like Nest, if she was a beauty, in quotes, definitely had a lot of brains to go along with it. She wasn't a fool. She was nobody's fool. And certainly she was not this weak-willed person who just allowed things to happen to her. If she was, as the Chronicle of the Princess suggests, basically helping her husband escape and taking the consequences of this raid. She is not someone 
who should be belittled. She should be held up as an important person in our historical understanding. Of course, it's colored by the fact that we have this story in our documents as opposed to other stories that we could have about strong women who led militaries, led uh, decision-making processes, sat on the councils of the local communities, may have been key in taking care of the sick, in dealing with the poor, and all of those things that we could point out they may have done. They may have been the leaders in the communities. We just don't know a lot about this. But this is one example we can use and one of the things that we have to look at. And we can't just fall back on the default thing about how we perceive the Middle Ages. The idea and the concept that, you know, culturally we understand that there may be these stereotypes about women both now and in that period. But we have to understand that these people played a huge role at every level. And you can't deny that. And like I said, one of the things that, that, that creates this issue and these misogynistic ideals comes out of the fact that they link her to her, her basic quality being motherly and the fact that she's a ancestor for so many people. Well, if you just evaluate her based on who she is, then to me what comes out of reading the text and what comes out of the history and the examinations that are done later by, by historians like Susan Johns, for example, who I'd highly recommend, this is a woman of strength. This is a woman of intelligence. This is a woman who... Much like Cleopatra, the idea that we have of her is based around this concept that she was this gorgeous woman who just happened to be a leader. When realistically, what may have attracted people to Cleopatra was the fact that she was a very intelligent person who knew a lot, who could command respect. And Nest may have been that same type of person and that it was the intelligence that draw people to her, not necessarily the beauty of her as we sometimes think of it. So I think we have to understand that. And I think we, if once we do understand that, we'll have a much better concept of kind of what the influences are for women in the lives of others. And unfortunately, we'll have to draw some of those ideals out of what is basically a writing that is geared towards and addressed to men. And so even as they may be perceived as being invisible in the background, they are really important people to our story. They need not be invisible. And we need to remind ourselves of that because the reality of it is the archaeology tells us that there's loads of evidence of women who appear to have been considered to be important. And even our histories tell us some of that. Boudicca was one of the examples of a woman who's used by Tacitus, basically, to harangue imperial Rome, but still her story tells us a lot. It tells us a lot about how early Romano-Britons looked at their female leaders. And I think we can make the argument that, that while the influence of Rome and the way it looked at society and how it looked at women definitely carries forward in the way that British women are perceived after that period, there is definitely an example after example after example of women's influences either through the archaeological record where we find women who have been buried with weapons, they've been buried with fine things which kind of designate them in more of a chiefly role. Uh, there are examples of this and we'll find more as we continue to look and I'm sure we'll come to realize that that our perceptions about this are going to change consistently. And I think Nest is a fine example of this. Rather than get overly focused on the ideal woman, the ideal perception, this matronly person who just happens to have a lot of children, look at the idea that she is, in all actuality, a mentally strong person who could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the most important people in Britain, not just in Wales, but in Britain. I mean, this is somebody who who had a relationship with a king of England, this is a person to be respected, to be honored, and to be carefully measured historically on what she offers and gives to us. And I think in future, when we look at these perspectives and we start to look at things like, you know, various aspects of culture, when we look at 
who people are in the actual record, we'll start to see that there are differences from our normal perceptions in the way that history was written. And we'll start to see those so-called invisible people start to appear, and they will become important to our story, as they really are. Like, let's be honest. They are important to the history of the world, and they shouldn't be invisible at any level. No matter what culture, no matter what gender, they should not be invisible. And I think it's important to remember that. And going forward, we're going to talk a lot more about the contributions of various people. And hopefully we'll be able to continue to diversify this conversation away from just being about the kings, just being about you know, battle here, battle there. But certainly we're going to talk a lot more in depth about the story of Wales history that goes forward from the end of the 11th century and into the 12th, because there's lots of things that are changing at this stage. And it's certainly the dominance of Normans in southern Wales is affecting northern Wales and influencing the culture. It's influencing the religion. It's influencing everything that we have to look at in understanding the society and culture at the time. And one of the things that we are going to talk about in the future is we're going to talk about the Welsh participation in the Crusades and kind of how that came to be and how it was driven and what we need to think about when we look at that. And I think it's a really fascinating discussion to talk about these things that I think a lot of people haven't talked about in depth. And, and to have that opportunity to discuss these, I think, is one of the, the things I value about this podcast. Anyway, until next time, everyone, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can reach me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can reach me online on Twitter at Welsh History Pod. On Facebook, you can find us at facebook.com for such Welsh History Podcast. And of course, uh, don't hesitate to leave us a review on iTunes or any other uh, podcatching service that you might have access to. And thank you all so much for listening, so much for your comments. And I hope that this was a helpful episode for you all. Until next time, we'll talk to you later. Take care, everyone. Bye. Edge of the Abyss Creations is a proud sponsor of the Welsh History Podcast, your one-stop shop for unique jewelry, paintings, and other crafty creations. You can find us at facebook.com slash edgeoftheabyss1. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more info, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com. A news story gets shared by a friend on social media, or you catch a tweet that really makes your blood boil. But how do you separate fact from fiction? That's the premise behind Disinformation, a 10-part series from Evergreen Podcasts and Emergent Risk International coming this fall. Tune in to Disinformation wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, don't believe everything you read.